Executive Education at Imperial College Business School. And welcome to the Imperial Future Matters webinar series. Each month, we discuss a global challenge with our world leading faculty from across college. Imperial College Business School is different. It's a business school within a global top 10 STEM university. Across college, our strategy is focused on five cross-cutting themes that fuel our mission to inspire brilliant minds to be the world's future leaders of business and society. That involves all the faculties, business, engineering and technology, Let's get that one working. There we go. Um, uh, all the faculties, uh, uh, business, engineering and technology, medicine and natural science. And some of the themes that we're seeing across college that drive our research are around digital transformation, financial and institutional resilience, sustainable development and social responsibility, healthcare innovation, management and policy, and of course, the economics and finance of climate change. In executive education, we consistently hear from businesses that problems or opportunities are more complex than ever. So we're able to draw on insights and methods from across the college. Our discussion today might or should touch almost all of us. How customer centric is your organization and what should you do? It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Rajas Bagrave. Rajas's leading research, teaching and consulting are around how consumers purchases and decisions are influenced by their social environment and the interaction of the online and physical world, worlds on consumer behavior. He looks at experiential desi experimental design and analysis, as well as research methods relating to customer centricity. Rajesh will share some observations for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have time for your questions. So please do use the Q&A session Q&A function on your screen, and we'll come to the questions towards uh, in about 25 minutes. So Rajesh, it is my pleasure, over to you. Thank you, David, and thank you for that very warm introduction. And for those of you attending today, thanks for uh, your engagement today. Looking forward to your questions. Uh, so today's topic on customer centricity, I think it's one that we can all think about whatever type of organization you're in. How do we define customer centricity? How do we achieve it? Uh, and so what I wanna share with you today are just some of the challenges that come up with customer centricity, some examples of organizations that do this right. Uh, and then we'll also take your questions at the end, as David mentioned. So let's first think about what customer centricity is ultimately. Ultimately, it's about putting your customers at the center but we don't wanna make that a hollow phrase. It's much more than just saying, we have a motto that we care about customers. It should be reflected in everything you do as an organization, from whom you hire, to your day-to-day -day operations, to the products and services that you offer. And so we'll be looking at some organizations that do this well, uh, and it's, uh, entire top to bottom focus on customer centricity. Uh, I wanna share one of those examples with you. It's a company called Zappos. Uh, you may have heard of Zappos. It's a online shoe retailer uh, acquired by Amazon a few years ago. And Zappos is world renowned for its customer service, its customer centricity, and also is a great place to work. And if you look at how Zappos achieves customer centricity, for them, it's all about customer service. You order your shoes online, it's delivered to you, and we can think about that as just a delivery of a product. And 
sometimes customers will have complaints and we have customer service centers for that. But Zappos takes it a bit further than that. They say our customer service center should not just be to take complaints. It should not just be reactive. Rather, it should be proactive. So they have this concept of customer care, and that's the ethos behind their entire customer service area. And customer care being proactive means any purchase that's made with Zappos, they think about how can we delight that new customer that we acquire and those customers who keep coming back, how do we continue to delight them? Now, there's more to that Zappos story though. Just achieving customer care in terms of one division in the company, that's nice. But why Zappos is especially uh, famous for their customer centricity, we want to take a look back at the story of Zappos, how it was founded, how it grew. And the finding uh, with Zappos is at the very beginning, thinking about how it was founded, uh, it was started in the Bay Area of the US, San Francisco area. And this is an area that uh, is well known for tech companies and Zappos thought, let's locate there as well. And they found that they were able to achieve those things that they wanted to upfront, which is designing the good website um, and having the great technical specifications of being an e-commerce company uh, because that area had the right talent for that high tech. Uh, what they struggled with though in those early years is thinking about their ultimate aim of being a customer centric company and being known for customer service. Because the challenge in the Bay Area was finding the right talent related to customer service and being able to afford that talent in that area. They found that if they wanted to really deliver on this promise of being the customer service company online, um, they need to find that right talent. They may need to go somewhere else. So as they struggled with this issue, they thought, where can we locate that would be better for our company's vision? Uh, and so they decided to move the company from the San Francisco Bay Area to Las Vegas, which is an area that has uh, a huge hospitality sector and an excellent talent pool of people who are very passionate about customer service. So they moved the entire company to the Las Vegas area and then started from there. And that's really where their growth took off. Being known for a customer service company, they had the talent and then delivered on it going forward. Now, that is a dedication to customer uh, centricity that uh, I think is very admirable. Uh, and it's a, a, it's a very strong decision. It's a, a risky decision that was made, uh, but it paid off for Zappos. And I again and again see that companies that make customers truly the center of everything that they do, it ultimately does pay off if you do this the right way. Uh, so the Zappos story gives us an indication of what some of the, the best companies are thinking about in terms of customer centricity. Let's take a step back. Why are so many companies right now zooming in on this issue of customer centricity? And there are some longer term trends that relate to this issue. It's that one, there's an overall trend over the last couple of decades or more towards customer empowerment. And here I mean, when we think about customers' choices and how they access information about products and services and companies, they have a lot more going for them now than they did before. They can access a lot more information. They have more choices. Uh, and so the balance of power between companies and customers is shifting more towards the customers over the last couple of decades. And that means organizations need to work especially hard to reach those customers and keep them satisfied. The second thing is that customer behavior is changing and it's changing very rapidly. And here I mean that there's always been changes in customers' needs and in the technology for which we use to service those customers. Uh, but those changes are speeding up. There's an acceleration. Digital transformation is happening faster and faster every year. Uh, and that means we really need to track our customers much better. And being a customer-centric organization gets us on top of those things. So those are some of the, the factors going on on the customer side. But 
on the organizational side, there's also an excellent opportunity to understand our customers. Greater sophistication in understanding customers is happening because of this revolution towards getting more data on our customers, big data, or even as we'll talk about here, some of the small data on our customers. That sophistication allows us to really understand our customers and then act upon that in the right way. So these are some longer term trends and we see the example there with Zappos and there are many other uh, good companies doing customer centricity right. Um, and the Zappos example of making the decision about where to locate, that's a big decision. Many organizations though are thinking about this issue, how can we become more customer centric at the margins, given that we have certain constraints, given that we have a certain way of operating as a business, what are the challenges in customer centricity and how can we overcome them through smaller steps? And that's what I wanna talk about then next. Uh, I wanna think about the challenges that come up in customer centricity and how we overcome then those challenges. So the first of which I wanna talk about, if we want to become a customer-centric organization with the customer really at the heart of everything that we do, then the first challenge that comes up is trying to take the customer's perspective, understanding where they're coming from, how they engage with our products, services, and with our people. Uh, and that's not always so easy to do. Um, we try really hard through multiple methods to take our customer's perspective. To try to illustrate this challenge though, I want to engage with you here first in a poll and um, see your own experiences when it comes to taking the customer's perspective. And it relates to that potential gap between you and your customers. And so I'm gonna launch a poll here in a moment where I'd like you to think about, are you personally in the target market for your company's products and services? Uh, so let me open up that poll. Okay, I think this poll is live now. So are you personally in the target market for your company's products and services? Indicate if you've never have been, you were at some point, yes, but barely, or yes, definitely. All right, so we're getting about two thirds of our audience has completed. Let's see. Okay, I think uh, it's coming together now. So we have a, a mix of different um, reactions here. We're about a quarter of you have never been in the target market for your company's products and services. Some of you were at some point, which at least gives you that experience to be able to take that customer's perspective. Um, and then there's about 43% of you who, yes, definitely you are in the company's target market. Um, so already we see that more than half of you um, might uh, wonder, are you in the target market? Probably not for more than half of you. And then can you really take that customer's perspective in the same way, thinking about how a customer would react to your products or services? Uh, even those of you who, are, who answer yes, definitely, Think about this major gap between you and your customers. If you're working in an organization related to delivering some kind of service, as an example, and you might use that service. The difference is though your customers are not as passionate about this as you might be because they're not engaging with the service on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not uh, the center of their world. Um, so already there can be a gap, even if we're in the target market, we know much more about that product or service than do our customers. Gaps like this exist and it's difficult to take uh, a different perspective in that way. Okay, so I'm gonna close that poll. All right, uh, and let's continue then from that. Given that challenge exists that we are not our customers, um, how do we try to take our customer's perspective better than? So, there's a number of qualitative tools that I would uh, encourage uh, organizations to think about using to 
uh, engage with our customers and learn their perspectives better. Um, you've come across these in terms of in-depth interviews and focus groups with our customers. But I really wanna highlight here two tools that um, really make a difference in taking our customers' perspective, observation and ethnography, as well as journey maps. So here, when we think about taking our customers' perspective, we don't want to just get their attitudes and how they react to our products and services. We wanna actually see how they experience the value of our product or service over time. If you have a software as a service, as an example, uh, and that kind of solution, we wanna see on a day-to-day -day basis how our customers are using that service, what pain points come up, if we can observe that and, and uh, engage with them deeply and gross ourselves into their situation um, as much as we can to learn from that uh, on a day-to-day, -day, we can then see much more about that customer's perspective. That kind of observation can then feed into a journey map, which could either discuss the journey that a customer takes to uh, acquire a product to make a purchase decision, or the user journey, how that customer experiences a usage occasion with our product or service. That kind of tracking that customer over time gives us much more into the customer's perspective than simply just asking them their opinions. So I would urge more and more organizations to think about using these kinds of tools. There are uh, quantitative tools as well. We um, are often familiar with the surveys that we conduct on our, uh, our, our customers, uh, which are very beneficial as well. But a couple of things that are often overlooked when we really wanna to try to take our customer's perspective, we wanna think about not just asking them their opinions in a survey, but trying to understand how they make decisions. How do they pick between different options? How do they make trade-offs between uh, uh, say price and a feature uh, or a set of features? And one of the most powerful and robust tools for doing that is uh, a tool that we call conjoint analysis where you can present to your customers different options like option A that has a set of features um, and option B that has a different set of features with different prices in a, a, a market research survey, asking them which, pick between those two options, get their choice, have them then pick between two other options, C and D with different features, get that choice and so on. You get a series of choices in a choice-based conjoint analysis, and you come to learn how those customers make trade-offs. Right? So this is a much more natural way in which people uh, can report their preferences because it's all measured in an indirect way. So tools like this can be really powerful for learning how our customers make decisions. Uh, another is uh, the use of experiments. It's fine to study preferences like the one that I just mentioned, but ultimately the proof is what works there in the real world, what works in, a, in the field. Uh, and so the companies that use more experimentation, changing their products or services across different markets, changing the way they promote their products and marketing communications, or even changing their prices in such a way for experimentation for the purpose of learning. Um, but through that process of learning, they can better optimize. And it's all ultimately based on how the customer is making uh, the decision. So those are a couple of uh, distinct ways, qualitative and quantitative tools that we can use to understand our customer's perspective. And hopefully then we've achieved that point where we know what our customers are thinking when they're engaging with us, but there's still a second challenge. And that second challenge is even if you can take your customer's perspective, there's a risk that you may not have that top of mind on a day-to-day -day basis when you're thinking about your customers and working on your uh, strategy and tactics. And so the second challenge is the distance that we naturally have from our customers. Uh, so we may learn a lot about our customers, but once we're busy uh, with our usual work plans, we often can forget about those uh, insights about our customers. So that second challenge, um, I wanna launch a second poll related to this. 
So let me go ahead and launch this poll. All right, and this is uh, related to the issue of um, how much distance we feel from our customers. All right, and the question is what percentage of your staff makes contact with customers or end users on a monthly basis or more? Okay, let's see. So we're getting um, less than 10%, 21%. We have 10 to 25%, 17%, uh, between a quarter and a half, 12% um, of you are saying. Uh, and then 75% or more, so more than three quarters, about 29%. So this one is quite mixed as well. Uh, but what we can see is that in a lot of organizations, a big percentage of our staff may not be making contact with customers or end users on a monthly basis. And I think a monthly basis uh, might be the kind of frequency that for some uh, organizations, that's the number we need. Uh, keeping them top of mind through a direct contact, um, that will be important to have that kind of empathy towards our customer. It's one thing to really learn about them, as we saw in the first set of challenges, but we need to keep them in our hearts and work and motivate towards that customer and having those direct contacts uh, can help with that. All right, so I think we'll stop the poll for now and we see the uh, end result is 28% of you more than three quarters, but a lot of you far less than half. Okay, so thinking about this, how do we, um, address this challenge of our distance from our customers? Well, the general point is we're collecting a lot of data on customers. And what we wanna do is try to meet the customers behind the data. That is, um, rather than um, just keeping them as numbers, try to find the real people who generate those numbers for us. who are giving us certain scores or uh, buying certain products from us. And meeting the customers behind the data could be done in a variety of ways. It doesn't necessarily mean always meeting them face to face. Uh, and how we might do this. One of uh, the other companies that I want to share with you as a company that does customer centricity really well is uh, Slack. So Slack is really known for customer satisfaction and being a, uh, seen as a great place to work. I think the two are very related. Uh, and so what Slack does uh, in order to meet this end of keeping that customer top of mind much more, they have a, a staff who collect customer stories. They go out in organizations and learn how their own customers are using Slack. They collect those stories and, um, and share those in newsletters within the organization. Those are very helpful in keeping the customer top of mind for those who may not have the opportunity to meet with the customers directly. And having those regular newsletters, featuring it on the website, all of those things keep the customer more top of mind. Some other ways in which we can achieve this, and this is where we can try to be uh, innovative, see what works for us within our organization in terms of keeping the customer top of mind. And um, one of those that I wanna share a story here, which is uh, involving a, a company that wanted to ensure that they were taking the customer's perspective. And they thought about how can we achieve this in our meetings? Uh, and they thought we could try to do this in a physical manifestation of the customer. So they decided that the problem they were facing within meetings that the customer would often got, get forgotten, let's then have a seat for the customer. And that seat would be mentally occupied by the customer every time they had an important meeting. Another way you can physically manifest uh, the awareness of the customer and keeping them closer to us is think about how we keep our family and friends close to us with photos. You may have photos of your family in your office. Uh, within an organization, within the physical office space, maybe not your personal office, but just thinking about the hallways, 
can we not also include photos of our customers and stories about our customers to keep us motivated, to keep us keep those customers more top of mind? Um, so some of then the concrete ways we can try to reduce that distance so that they are top of mind, that we're motivated to act upon our insights uh, regarding customers, directly interacting with those customers on a regular basis. Some of the most customer-centric organizations uh, have uh, a targets of meeting their customers every quarter, even among senior management. Uh, internal marketing efforts, like those customer stories with Slack, and then the in-office displays. Those could be pictures of our customers, they could be personas, journeys, quotes, a lot of options. But we, if we believe in customer centricity, that should be reflected in the way we even organize our space. The third challenge I want to touch on here is uh, the organizational change that is required to deliver on um, those moves towards customer centricity. So it's not enough to just say, we wanna be customer centric and here are a couple of things that we're gonna do. It needs to be reflected in every part of the organization. And those kinds of changes can be difficult. There's growing pains in moving towards customer centricity. Uh, and so here, what we wanna think about what changes might be needed in an organization to develop that customer centricity. First and foremost, leaders must buy into a customer centric culture. That is when we think about what are the principles behind that company? We wanna make sure our mission statements, everything is all ultimately leading towards how we are providing value towards customers. From the leaders then, it can then flow down to throughout the organization and through a lot of the big decisions that are made within the organization that ultimately lead to customer centricity. The second is thinking about who we're hiring, how are we building up our staff and, and how are we onboarding and training them? Um, so this process, can we not hire more for customer orientation and empathy? Think about when you interview candidates, to what extent are you asking them and, and probing how customer oriented they are? How able are they to take that customer's perspective or figure out what gaps exist between them and their, the customers? There's a lot of other skills, of course, that we're interested in. Um, but what we would like for a customer-centric culture is that everyone has bought into it and at least has a potential to grow in this customer orientation and empathy. Then a, a third issue when it comes to organizations, how we ultimately lead to customer centricity. The overall motto here is uh, what gets measured gets managed. And if we're gonna say we're a customer-centric culture, then we wanna have KPIs are, um, that can measure uh, those outcomes about customer centricity. And two of the ones that I'll uh, quickly share with you, one is the net promoter score, thinking about measuring how many of our customers would be willing to recommend our products and services to others, and customer satisfaction. These are not the only measures, but to what extent are we using these measures as important performance criteria for our organization. The more that our uh, measurement criteria are about achieving customer value, the more likely we are gonna develop that customer-centric culture. So to summarize here then, I've shared with you a couple of examples and, and some of the challenges that come up and why we're thinking so, hardly, uh, so hard on this issue of customer centricity. Um, and the three things I want to summarize here, what often are overlooked. One, we wanna take our customer's perspective and the way we can do that is try to observe the value to customers as they actually experience it. That is rather than just asking them their attitudes, try to learn how they're engaging with our products and services, observe them, see their journeys. The second is just learning about our customers is not enough. We also need to act on that. We need that motivation. There needs to be that emotion within the organization and reducing the distance becomes that important step. And the third is for these uh, goals to be achieved, we ultimately need to have that reflected in the organization's focus. 
rather than focusing on our own internal matters more and other, um, uh, other benchmarks, we need to think about our customer and are we achieving our goal of customer value um, uh, in that case. So uh, I wanna thank you for your attention here and I'm really looking forward to your questions in the Q&A uh, and um, uh, hope to engage with you further. Um, so David, I will stop the screen and I think- Terrific. We'll... Huh? Thank you, that was, that was fascinating. We've had some, some super questions coming in over the Q&A and so let me encourage you to uh, ask, ask more. So um, please use the Q&A button, which is labeled Q&A right in the middle of your screen, so it should be. So um, let me start with this one uh, that, that we've, we've had. Um, in 1954, Peter Drucker said, the only valid definition of a business purpose is to create and retain a customer. Why is it that so many firms are still not customer centric when the need is so obvious and I would add long-standing? Yeah, so David, I think that's a, a important question. I, and I don't wanna make too strong of a statement that, that organizations are not customer centric, but they can definitely improve in these ways. And some of the most successful companies are uh, customer centric. I think what happens though, uh, in terms of why companies will struggle with this is they lose sight of the customer over time, that they achieve success in other ways. They become product focused, they become service focused, they become focused on internal organizational matters. Those are all important, of course, but ultimately the success of a company is based on the customer. So I think a, a lot of it is that it's very hard for every one of us to keep so many things in our heads at one time, to have multiple missions. And for an organization, it's the same thing. And what I'm really trying to advocate for here is ultimately we still need to have the customer as the center of everything that we do. And the purpose of a business is to uh, create customers and keep them around. And, um, and I think that that simple insight can often be lost because of just too many other things that are happening within organizations. So um, that's great, thank you. And in fact, there's a sort of a follow, you've answered the follow-up question in, in part, which is you've spoken about, you know, kind of what happens. But uh, the question here uh, from uh, 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 Ruben Alexander, um, most of the examples you shared are from new companies. Is it inevitable that as firms mature, they become less customer centric? So that's an interesting one. I, I definitely noticed that a lot of the most customer centric companies are relatively new or the ones that have been um, uh, lauded for being so good at this. Um, but I think that's a bit of a, a that recent companies and they're growing up in a time in which customer centricity is so important, these relatively newer companies. And when you're a new firm, you have no other option other than to be passionate about the customer and, and center everything towards the customer. Um, and I think what happens as companies achieve some success, as they develop their brand, as uh, they have uh, these barriers to market entry and great resources, uh, they may not engage as much with customers as they did when they were younger. Uh, and there's a, a great potential loss in that case. That being said, there are a lot of um, excellent organizations, companies that have a long heritage, but still maintain that value of customer centricity and continue to do well. And this also differs by sectors. If you look at the hospitality industry, you look at hotels, um, all the hotel companies know the importance of customer centricity. So even the the Ritzes and the others who have been around for a long time, they still maintain that orientation. Okay, thank you. So we've got a lot of questions. I'm gonna combine a couple here from uh, 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 Paul Kahn and Anonymous, um, uh, uh, Jan uh, Pulika, if I, apologies for the pronunciation on this, um, around net promoter scores. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's a couple of questions and let's put them together, which is um, um, 
the uh, the original literature was the ultimate question. Um, mm. Uh, but more recent studies have said that's a ridiculous question. So um, it's not the right methodology. And then there's a second question around that, which is, could you explore how NPS works in a B2B environment? Mm. Yeah, so uh, I tend to uh, agree with the more recent views on it, which is definitely this is not the end all, the only score that matters, which is the original title uh, of uh, the article. Um, I think it's a useful tool. I think it works in some uh, domains. It doesn't work in everything. Um, and, uh, and part of it, the, the issues that come up is the nature of the question. How likely would you be to recommend our products or services to a friend or colleague? Mm. And we think about that question in the net promoter score. Not everyone is responding in the same way to that. They're thinking about, would I spontaneously recommend this product to someone? Uh, and maybe there are reasons why um, your friends or colleagues might have a different preference or you wouldn't recommend it for that reason. I think people answer it in various ways. It differs by culture, differs by sector. Um, and so it is, um, it's not a perfect measure by any means. Um, that being said, it is meant to try to move the, the perspective from just being good enough to try to measure how many people like us a lot enough that they would say they would vouch for it, that they would be willing to tell someone this is a good product. Uh, and I think at least that part of the NPS is beneficial. Um, and as far as I think, David, your second question was about how would it work in B2B sectors? Um, so a lot of the NPS is used in B2B. Um, and so I don't see it necessarily limited there. Um, but I do think that it is it works better in some sectors than in others. So for example, those sectors where you can truly focus on quality and think about um, what makes for a good product or service that you would want to share with your friend or colleague where you're concerned about the quality of products and services, then that promoter score is a perfectly valid measure. It's saying, um, I'm aware that not all of the solutions work that well, but this one I'm happy to promote. But in other sectors where maybe those concerns are not as great, and it's more about differences in preferences, and I may have a different preference from David or someone else, then maybe that measure is not really that diagnostic. Uh, I'll say one more point on this, which is NPS has its limitations. It has some benefits. Uh, we don't want to just zoom in on one measure. That's, I think, the, uh, the key takeaway. We want to try different things and see how they relate to our own performance in other ways. Great, thank you. Uh, I mean, certainly within uh, our business, we use uh, exec ed, we use, in exec ed, we use NPS, uh, not quite religiously, but not far from it. But we also ask some of the subsequent questions around you know, what, 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 what drove you to um, score 9, 10 or, or mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, there's a yeah, very interesting question here, uh, and I, I, I love this idea that um, it was the ultimate question, the NPS one, and there are other ultimate questions in business. They can't all be ultimate questions. Mm -hmm. But this one is, uh, is saying, uh, it's going right to the heart of customer centricity, which is uh, Rowan Carstensen. Uh, customer centricity is great, but isn't it more about looking after our people? And that if we look after our people, then, then great customer service will surely follow. I, I totally agree with that perspective. I, so when we think about that internal focus or customer focus, I see them as going hand in hand. That is, if you hire individuals within your organization and get them to be passionate about customers, they will get a lot more um, uh, motivation for their work. Uh, and you can see countless studies on this, is that if you work in an organization that is customer-centric, your own employees are much more satisfied with the nature of their work um, and they perform better. Um, and so we wanna think about taking care of our employees also so that they can take care of customers, but also trying to reinforce with those employees um, the value of customer centricity and seeing how that can help them later on. Uh, and I think it is totally natural once you are in an organization for some time, your orientation becomes about taking care of each other within your organization. And you care a lot about your teams um, and those who you're mentoring, for example. 
Um, but we want to take it a step further than that and say each one of us is working towards a mission, and that mission is to help our set of customers achieve their value. Uh, and when we have that, I think it helps a lot within the organization, keeping the motivation, the morale, the performance, all of those things are improved with customer centricity as well. Okay, great. It's, it's, the questions are fascinating. There's, um, you know, some vigorous views here. Um, um, Henry Ford and Steve Jobs were famously not fans of asking what the customers wanted. And, you know, kind of, they did okay. And then there's the legendary Walkman um, uh, example. Um, how do we sort of balance that idea of, uh, you know, real innovation, which is not customer driven, um, and this idea that customer centricity is so important? Yeah, so this is, a, this is a challenge that comes up, especially when we're thinking about developing new products and innovations. Uh, and I think those quotes are insightful to a certain extent. I mean, for one, not everyone is Henry Ford or Steve Jobs, and not everyone can brilliantly come up with the best innovations to start. Uh, but beyond that, if you look at those kinds of companies, they do engage with customers for their research. And it it's also about reframing it. What are they trying to learn? It's not that we want to always learn from our customers which is the best option out of a set of um, uh, features or products that we're developing. We really want to learn what customers' needs are, what do they value, and then it's up to you as an innovator to deliver on that in some way. Uh, and so maybe customers can't tell you what they would want, as the quote goes, uh, but they can tell you the struggles that they're having, their pain points. They can uh, show you a glimpse into their life. And those, uh, that kind of research is, is absolutely important for developing a, a new innovation. Okay, great, thank you. So um, on this idea of feedback, there's um, uh, Khalid uh, Joma or Juma um, has asked, um, how do you incentivize customers to give feedback? And uh, there's a related question here as well, is that you know, we're all getting a bit bored with feedback. Um, mm. And so increasingly people are getting paid, which means you're getting sort of, um, you know, advert, you're getting very biased results. And, um, and we've seen some of the dangers of polling, for example, uh, you know, in, uh, in other environments recently, have a, you can get it quite wrong. So yes. how do you get this right? Yeah, so this is a customer satisfaction service, for example. The ongoing issue is survey fatigue, just too many questions. I think we've all um, experienced this. Um, and so what it means is we need to be careful about why we're measuring something. I think often these KPIs like customer satisfaction, it, if you do it too long, it starts to become a, a tick box exercise where I just wanna say I've collected customer satisfaction and scores have gone up. Um, and this can happen with KPIs once you define that as being important in your organization. Um, and we don't wanna do it that way. We wanna measure when we're hoping to get some useful insights. And we also don't wanna abuse it. So sometimes asking customer satisfaction too much has the uh, perverse effect of actually reducing satisfaction because you're annoying your customers with too many of these surveys. Um, so some of the couple of, couple of steps that we can take. One, we need to reduce our frequency of such measures. Um, and we especially need to reduce it per customer. So we need to know when we're measuring for each customer satisfaction as an example uh, and space that out. So no one feels that fatigue with us. Uh, and we also need to take a bit more of a uh, outside perspective on it. You're not the only one sending out a satisfaction survey. How frequently are they receiving these? Uh, and even though we want to measure it the same way each time, maybe we can think about how to measure it in distinct ways, more creative ways, so that customers feel um, that it's actually engaging for them to provide you with feedback, knowing that you're going to act on that feedback uh, and that they, the moment in which they um, are providing their feedback to you, it's actually a fun experience. There are different ways of doing that. Gamification is one of the, the ways it's popping up. Um, and, and there's other, other ways of collecting insights as well that may not be as onerous on our customers. Okay, great, thank you, fascinating. So um, 
Uh, great question here from uh, from Joanne. Um, good to see you. Um, which is um, successful new companies um, often get bought by larger conglomerates. And so that, I think there's, there's two questions here, which is why is it that so much money seems to go into driving sort of market share and scale rather than customer service? And so that's one area. And if I may, I'm going to combine it with a, with a, uh, with another question is that um, what is your experience of firms with less good customer satisfaction buying smaller firms who are brilliant at it? Um, mm. And you know, does it ever work? The, hy the hypothesis behind the question is that uh, usually the rubbish culture survives. So um, yeah, so I, I, uh, I, I haven't looked at any data on that issue per se. Um, though I could see why the lowest common denominator we would tend to move towards that, how that can happen. Um, uh, so as far as the, the first part of the question is, uh, why is it more about market share and profitability? I think ultimately a lot of this is about um, how management's performance is measured. If it is based on market share and market capitalization and, and those things, uh, then naturally we're going to work more towards that. It's just going to flow throughout the organization. Uh, and maybe NPS, customer satisfaction, are not your best measures. But we want to have a, a suite of measures that are all about the customer. And we want to uphold those in thinking about what we're achieving as a company. It's not just growth. Um, uh, so I, I certainly see that organizations face all kinds of pressures uh, and the customer is not the only one. But for long-term uh, achievement of our goals, profitability and growth, um, ultimately we still need to be oriented towards the customer. Okay, great, thanks. Um, a question um, which is about, um, well, let me just read the question better. Um, I work within healthcare and our customers range, uh, range broadly. Um, uh, should we look at these customers as uh, individuals or groups? And when mm. well, you think of that, I'm just going to add one other question, let's just combine it, which is, you know, what is the right level of segmentation? I mean, can we overly customize? I think it's probably the same question. Can we do, are we at risk of overly customizing or at the individual level or what's the right group size? Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's a one answer to these because you can see in some sectors, the level of segmentation is, is immense. I mean, hyper segmentation uh, or even the level of customization per customer. Um, so it's, it's hard to say there and I'm not sure if I could answer for the healthcare sector. Um, but what we wanna make sure is that the segments we do have that if we are segmenting, that that is providing us with valuable information about changes to our strategy and tactics. We're not just creating these segments um, just to say that we have learned more from our customers. We wanna act on that. We wanna see what are those differences across customers and are we um, satisfying them then in different ways? Um, so at the point at which we're not changing anything about what we do in terms of our product or service or um, the way we uh, reach our customers, that maybe that segment can be combined with another one. Um, so these should be actionable segments. Um, okay, Action, actionable segments. There's uh, something to stick with. Um, the uh, we we had a seminar with um, um, Deep Chana and some uh, other folks a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the the question of the video, the social dilemma, came up, which mm. on Netflix is about. Um, and this next question, I think it touches on parts of this. Um, in terms of understanding the, the customer or consumer, are there some limits? I mean, for example, uh, some may think some of the social media platforms understand us too well. And you know, they're brilliant at hyper-personalization, um, but at what cost? Yeah, I think we're seeing a backlash for this already, both with the these kinds of films uh, and just among regular uh, consumers and, and users. Uh, so 
the challenge we're facing is we're collecting a lot of data, though people are willing to give up a lot of data as well, mm -hmm. sometimes outside of their awareness. Um, but we have to do things ethically. And um, the, the motto that's used here, we think about the value exchange. What am I offering to our customers in exchange for their data? Um, and I think many co companies now are going a bit too far with this and collecting a lot of data that they don't need and that don't benefit the customer in some way. Um, so I don't think that there's a limit on how much we can um, know about our customers in a general sense. We wanna know what their needs are. We wanna know what they value, uh, but there's a limit on how much we can intrude upon our customers in that process of learning from them. Uh, and we need to figure out what is intrusive. You would not go into someone's home and, and take a pair of binoculars and watch them on the inside just to learn what they're doing. There should be limits there in the physical world just as there would be in the online world. Um, and we don't always need to get people to download our app just so we can collect their data. Uh, I think what often happens in these cases is um, we have, uh, departments that are incentivized to just collect as much data as you can, where the volume of data becomes a performance metric. How much data can you collect? That's a good indication that you're being a data-centric um, company. But as, as I discussed earlier, not all the most useful data is big data. There's a lot of importance of that softer qualitative data where we can learn a lot more. And uh, in those cases, uh, that could be data that might be expensive to acquire, may not reflect the, all of our customers, but it could be much more insightful in some ways, and it's not rife with these kinds of issues of data privacy. Um, so I think it's uh, this move towards social media and being able to acquire data like that, it's a valuable move, it's, it's a nice development, but it's also developed uh, into a, a big hype as well. We're, I think organizations lose focus of other ways of learning about our customers. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just reminded that uh, the, some of the um, FMCG companies actually used to go and do these observational studies in people's homes, actually. I don't know whether that still happens. Yeah, yeah, that still happens. Uh, and um, it, you can learn a lot by watching someone um, cook at home and, and see what pain points come up in those cases. So we've got just time for a couple of a couple more questions. Um, is the uh, well, there's a couple of broad ones, which is the first question: Is the millennial different, or are we seeing different sort of ge generational changes in terms of um, uh, how people are interacting with customer research? Mm. Yeah. So I think it's rather than framing it as a generational change, I think it's more of a technological change uh, more than anything. And part of the reason I feel this way, a lot of the comments about millennials and baby boomers and these generations and Gen Z, usually what you'll find is a change that's adopted by Gen Z or millennials or uh, Gen X are quickly adopted within a bit of time by older generations. So it's just that younger generations take on technology faster. They're in a different point of their life. Uh, it's an age effect more than a cohort effect. Uh, and, uh, but the technology is definitely, uh, has, has changed so much in the way we collect data, the way customers make choices. Um, so I do think this era is unique in that way um, and it's just rapidly evolving. Um, so I don't really see the, the millennial as, as a special kind of animal in any sense. Yeah, great, thank you. So uh, perhaps the last question, which relates to the generational question from um, James Ruck, I think it is. Um, hi, how do you see customer centricity evolving in the future, say 20 years from now? Oh, wow. Okay, now I can... Um, now you uh, can cut this. Yeah, yeah, however I feel. Uh, I, I think this trend towards customer centricity or the, uh, the trends that I mentioned earlier are gonna continue to accelerate and that it's still gonna lead to more and more power towards customers and less towards companies. And just take another completely un, uh, different issue is these kinds of pressures that are coming up. Uh, companies are facing competition from 
uh, players all over the world. Competition can be anywhere. It's not just within your local market or um, nearby countries, it could be anywhere. Uh, and so that means companies have more of a challenge to try to reach our customers. So I think there will be a move towards that. Uh, I think the nature of work is changing as well. And again, I don't think it's about millennials per se, it's just we're thinking about even now, the move towards working from home and what people value. Uh, and I think if you want to get the, the right kind of talent, if you want to attract great young talent now, um, having this ethos of customer centricity is helpful. Um, and uh, with the changes in work, people shifting from one organization to the next uh, within a couple of years and having multiple careers to what drives an organization is, is the best people. And so in overall, then I'm saying this pressure towards customer centricity is gonna be more and more over the next 20 years. How then the companies actually act upon that I think they're going to come up with innovative solutions. They're going to, this whole digital transformation will mature, that we're not going to necessarily be engaging in, in all of this data collection on our customers through social media. We're going to diversify. Um, and uh, we think about social media being in its teenage years right now, or uh, it's not quite mature yet. Um, and uh, in a bit of time, uh, those models will change and we'll learn more in a different way. So uh, without predicting a specific technology, which I can't say in 20 years, um, I, I do think that I'm overall optimistic towards this. Okay, terrific. I think with that 20-year view, we'll, we'll, we'll draw it to a close. So uh, perhaps allow me a few closing comments. Um, Rajesh, thank you for absolutely fascinating and, 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 and challenging discussion like some of the research that we do there is so much in the last hour and the question is whether we have the insight and uh, and bravery to uh, to latch on to some of those things so um let me um uh, well thank you david for having me on and thanks everyone for all the great questions as well indeed indeed so please do uh, visit our website uh, at imperial uh, College Business School for more information about uh, Imperial's work in marketing and indeed um, uh, many other areas. Um, we slides and recordings of this and past sessions will be available on the website and you can see some of the uh, um, topics that we've covered. In the new year, uh, let me show this. In the new year, um, Imperial Future Matters will have a terrific discussion exploring the impact of coronavirus on our professional networks, part of the glue that holds our lives together. Indeed, um, our professional lives and our organizations will explore the impact of corona on getting things uh, done, getting new jobs, and indeed, as we've just been talking about, innovation and not just uh, the what, uh, uh, the impact, but what do, can we each do about it? So Rajesh, thank you. Um, thank you all for your questions.